audience participation asking questions as well. Um, are you ready, Brady? Yes, sorry I missed all the introductions. I'm first. No? Jen's oh, first. Oh, who knew? Do you want me now? You Sorry, can go in any order you want, then. actually. You got your slides? Uh, they're on the desktop. On the program. Yes. Okay. Are you ready, Brady? Yep, you're ready. You're on? Yep. Okay, here you go, Jen. Where are you going? You want to talk from the table? Uh, no, oh, I don't mind. Do you want me to? Wherever. I'll stand here like a presenter. <laughs> so you just saw my notes there, actually, that popped up, where I'd written, I am here today to talk to you as an academic. <laughs> um, but honestly, when I was um, writing this presentation, the first thing that came to my mind was my own personal experience. And it's an interesting kind of thing, because these are my children. Um, I've worked in various bits of research relating to LGBT families, to uh, fertility in the LGBT community, reproductive choices, donor conception, a sort of a whole range of different topics related to family diversity um, and parenting. Um, and as a lesbian parent, I've always struggled with how you manage that personal academic kind of divide because as um, many people in this room would be aware, um, you can get really slammed <laughs> in this area for your personal life. Um, so a lot of the research that I've done and, um, and the colleagues who I've worked with who are also queer parents um, have had our research quite discredited in certain circles for being LGBT parents, just on the basis that obviously we have an agenda as LGBT parents to prove that there's nothing wrong with our children. Um, so I've always managed that divide in a sort of, I don't know, fairly... Um, not a very good way really, honestly, but I've sort of managed it by trying to either speak personally or speak profession or speak as an academic and speak about evidence and keep myself out of it um, and, either, and sort of do that separately and that works to a certain extent, but honestly, as we all know, you know, that, that doesn't really happen in research. If you're writing on any topic, it's always through the lens of your own experience. And certainly when it came to schools, the lens of my own experience was the first thing that came to mind. So I'm going to talk about that begin with. Um, so that's my oldest son Benji, he's seven, he's in grade one, Jolene's younger. Um, I was just saying before, I'm not a very good baker, really bad baker, and I made these cupcakes and they looked awesome and I was so proud of myself that I took a photo for Facebook and by the time I'd actually posted the photo on Facebook, Jolene had licked the icing off every single one of those cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> so good parent in the modern age. Um, so Benji started school last year, he, he goes to a pretty progressive inner city primary school. It's one in, you know, in one of those kind of lesbian ghettos in inner city Melbourne. <laughs> Number of queer parents in that area. I sent him there deliberately. I don't live in that area, but I, I wanted him to go to a school that was, um, that, where he wasn't the only child with queer parents. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but honestly, despite it being progressive, despite there being a lot of lesbian, and I don't know any gay parents, so lesbian specifically in that school, um, I find it quite intimidating, actually, engaging with the school community, and I didn't expect that. So I've spent a lot of time really kind of trying to unpack why that is, and I've had a long conversation with a heterosexual friend of mine whose kids go to the same school, um, who doesn't feel intimidated at all by that school community. She loves it. She loves school drop-offs. That's her source of friendship. It's where she catches <laughs> up with people. She's very, very confident in that environment, and I'm not. I find it... In I find it intimidating, I find it exposing, I feel quite vulnerable. Um, and I wasn't kind of prepared for the amount, the extent to which you need to engage in the community um, of a school. Like I kind of thought you'd drop your kid off, pick them up, but no way, you wouldn't have this too. Like it, it's constant, you're doing play dates, you're doing birthday parties, there's school sports, there's fake duty, there's reading committees, like you are engaged in this community. And people know about you, they know your families, they're very invested in knowing who their kids are friends, friends with. So when your child starts school, it's not just your child starting school. It's actually you as a family engaging in this community. And for me, as much as I had been always very open about my family, about my sexuality, I've spoken in public. You know, I once did a Q&A session in front of a group of family mediators about my separation experiences as a lesbian parent. Like it's, you know, I've spoken, I'm not a shrinking violet 
when it comes to talking about myself. But when it's sort of Monday morning and you're tired and it's people asking awkward questions about your family, and that certainly happened, it's much harder. You don't get to choose. You're sort of out there in this mainstream context. So I'm telling that story because, one, I didn't expect that prior to school age children, but also just to, I guess, make the point that it's not just children in schools, it's actually families and communities when we're talking about rainbow families. Um, and that's really a long-term relationship as well. Like, you're in this school for many, many years, the best part of a decade. So it's sort of about you as a, as a um, queer family finding your way in, into that community. And I quite like this quote. This is from a study that Joe Lindsay and colleagues did in Melbourne in 2006, um, where they really talk about um, the ways in which, or well, the study was about the ways in which lesbian families make decisions about school communities and then work their way through that school community or, or, or figure out how to engage with that community. And as you might expect, what they found in that study is that lesbian, and, and that they were speaking specifically to lesbians in this context, in this study, um, there's a whole different strategies and I'm sure none of that would be a surprise to a lot of people. So some families are very active, they're very, they're, they decide to be advocates for rainbow families within the school community and that's the way they approach it. Um, other people are very hidden. So some people decide to present as a single parent family and might downplay the role of one of the mothers in that, in that family. And a lot of the time people will do that, um, what sort of often depends on the age of the child, what the child's wanting. It might also just depend on the family constellation. So families perhaps where there is a father involved, say if those children had been um, born into a previous heterosexual marriage, there might be a greater tendency to sort of downplay the lesbian relationship and the two, two mother family. So there's a whole range of contexts and there's a whole, whole different context and there's a whole range of strategies people might employ <laughs> to engage with that school community and certainly deciding which school is, is part of that. But I think the interesting point in that study is that they're really talking about how it's all about information management for a family <coughs> and everyone's implicated in that. So if, if the parents decide they're gonna do that out and proud advocacy strategy, the children are then part of that and they're, they're having to follow through really on that strategy within the classroom and in an everyday level. So in terms of preparing that family to engage with schools, the parent's role is about deciding whether they're up for that, for being the advocate, for being the educator, but also whether their kids are up for that. And that, for families, is a difficult balance sometimes to, it, it's hard to make that decision because you're kind of ending up making a decision for your kid about what's gonna be okay for them in that school context, and that might change over time. Um, and it might be in tension, you know, with what they want or what they feel they need at, at any particular time. So it's sort of this process of constant negotiation in terms of being out, um, in terms of being very active, and in terms of um, helping a child manage that within a school, manage disclosure, essentially, within a school context. So it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing in that um, it's slightly different to LGBT kids in schools. You know, it's sort of, in, in terms of the decisions that you make as a family and the way that's managed as a family, there are definitely crossovers, <coughs> but there's a slightly different dynamic when we're thinking about families and schools and rainbow families and schools, I think. So there's not a lot of research on that. I found this interesting study, which is a US study done by the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, listen, in New York. Um, it was a national study um, where they surveyed school children and their parents about the way in which they engage with their school communities. It was a great study actually. Um, and that's kind of what they found. They found that a lot of the parents experienced this tension about how to manage their own engagement with the school in relation to, the, to what their kids wanted and what their kids needed. Um, and many parents actually weren't quite sure what strategy was best for them or best for their children. Many parents weren't confident themselves about being the educator, about being the advocate, about who to talk to. Um, many parents had experienced negative reactions from other parents. And remember, this was, this was country-wide, so you had much, many more conservative areas in the, in the States where that happened. Um, and I, I quite like that quote, you know, it was these parents who, um, had been made to feel invisible. They sort of felt excluded. So coming out in that school environment had to be a very active thing. No one was asking them. It was about really making it happen. 
but they decided not to because they just felt it wasn't safe for their child to do that. So it's kind of balancing safety. Um, so, sorry, moving on. I'm not using my notes, so I'm starting to get a bit choppy. But essentially, a lot of the research in this area isn't on the way families as a whole engage with schools. In reality, most of the research is on the children and how children cope within schools and, and the extent to which there are experiences of bullying or harassment within schools. Um, and there's a reasonable amount of research on that. There's not heaps, but it's certainly been done. Um, so that US study that I just referred to um, found a reasonably high level of um, teasing. So a number of students had experienced some sort of teasing related to their families in schools. Um, an Australian study, um, have I put in there? So Simon Crouch's study, which was done in about 2014, he found a number of students in that study had experienced some bullying, some teasing in schools. So these were young people, primary school and high school age. Um, but it actually wasn't massive. It's not as big as you would, it's not as prevalent as you would imagine. Um, so some students have, some students haven't. Mostly it's transient. The work I've done, we've found it's higher outside of that inner city middle class bubble, which you, you might imagine as well. But it's not the overwhelming experience of these students. In fact, mostly what, or these young people, mostly what you hear um, are people feeling anxiety about the potential for discrimination. And that mostly comes from hearing derogatory comments about gay people in schools, which you hear that so gay all the time. So of course people are hearing that, assuming that if they know that their families, um, if their mothers are lesbians, that it'll come back to bite them. So it's actually the anxiety about the potential for discrimination that affects wellbeing <coughs> more than actual instances of discrimination. And I'll come back to it in a second, but in some ways, um, instances of discrimination are possibly easier to deal with so I love that quote from this little girl where she's um, challenged what they said, you know, they, um, whatever they said, what I did about it was I said they were wrong. You know, she could actually challenge that. And the other thing that the research has found quite a lot is that kids in Rambo families are pretty resilient and they're pretty good at managing discrimination and managing bullying or teasing. And largely that's because their parents have created a narrative for them around the possibility for that happening but also where that's coming from. So these kids have an understanding, a kind of broader cultural understanding of homophobia, of where it comes from, of why that teasing might happen. And that gives them a way to, to distance it from themselves as a person and also to respond to it. So there's a few people that have written quite interesting stuff on that. Liz Short at Victoria Uni did some stuff on that a few years ago. Um, and also Simon found that as in his research as well. Like there is resilience. So bullying is one thing. And you know, sometimes you read the mainstream media and you'd be forgiven for expecting, you know, assuming these children are all in puddles on the floor, you're shivering from all the bullying. That's just not the case. It's actually more a worry about bullying, um, but there's also a resilience to that as well. You know, it's balanced. Um, but the other thing that does come up in research quite a lot is the absence of any sort of queer visibility in schools. So particularly in that American study, a lot of students reported um, and it also came up in um, Jo Lindsay's study about 10 years ago in Australia. A lot of students just reported that their family was never spoken about in any, in any classroom activity. In some cases, teachers had actively prevented students speaking about their family. And you can imagine why that might be the case. You know, these students, other teachers are assuming that talking about same-sex families amounts to talking about sex or sexuality in the classroom and they're worried about negative reactions to that or they're worried that that crosses a boundary. But you can imagine, you know, um, families are so central to everyday life that families are spoken about in English, in, lit uh, in literature, in history, in sociology, in social studies, in, in science, genetics. Families are in every topic, essentially. So if there's an invisibility of families, that cuts across your whole school day, potentially. And it actually takes um, quite an active program to challenge that to give teachers the resources and also the permission to include a diversity of families in that. And that would include single parents as well as same-sex couples and other family forms within that. Um, so really what the research is showing is that it's only if there's queer teachers in schools or some other sort of program that's actually actively trying to introduce family diversity into the curriculum that, 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 that's, that that's changed. Although, you know, again, back to me, um, in, in my experience, the, the 
school and even the childcare have been very open to including, like they've actively asked us for family photos, they put up posters, um, they'll, they'll read books and things. So quite inclusive, but it does take a reasonable amount of advocacy. Like it does take me giving them the book or the poster um, or taking the photos to take in. But you know, it, it, is, it is there, it's not, it's not that it's, it's not that people aren't trying. I think a lot of teachers and child educators are trying. How much time have I got? Five minutes. Oh, good, okay, perfect. All right, so then of course there is the question about what schools can do to become more inclusive in that active way. I don't have time to talk about that. There's a lot of resources for schools on what they can do. Um, but I did, wanna, I did wanna refer to this. So again, this is the US study, and it would be nice to have more evidence similar to this in America, because what this study found was that schools that had active safe schools policies um, so people that responded to this survey who were from a school that had an active safe school policy, so an active um, LGBT <coughs> inclusiveness policy, um, were much less likely to report any sort of harassment, much less likely to report feeling invisible or excluded within that school. Makes sense, but because it's the US and there's many more states in here, they were able to do a state-based comparison. So they found that people who'd responded from states that had state-level inclusive policies were also much less likely to report experiences of, the kids were less likely to ex report experiences of harassment and the parents were more likely to feel included in the school community. So shout out for inclusive state policies. Yay, Victoria, <laughs> for now. Um, so I did want to make that point, but the other thing I wanted to talk about was whether or not the kids are okay, because this inevitably comes up. You know, I get asked to speak on this topic all the time and invariably the evidence on whether the kids are doing okay is what people want to hear about. Um, and <laughs> it's actually a tricky thing to navigate because my first instinct is to say, well, why are you asking that? It's homophobic, you know, it's a homophobic assumption or presumption just to even ask that question. Um, and, and invariably people, you know, a lot of the time people are asking that question, not because they care about the answer, of course, but because they want evidence to back up their, their assumptions but I think that there's a lot of people in health professions so part of my work I've done a lot of training on training with um, health professionals so maternal child health nurses fertility clinics early childhood educators on working with same-sex families so I am coming back to my own anecdotal evidence in this session in this section but what I've found is that people in a lot of those professions are genuinely interested in this and it's partly because they, um, I don't mean to sound patronising, or very well-meaning, very interested in being inclusive, actively seeking education. They want to know more, they want to know what to do right, they want to know the right language, but may not ever have met a gay or lesbian or trans person ever, or knowingly, or, or they just haven't spent much time with LGBT people. Um, and a lot of these people can't, these people, it sounds terrible. But there are people who just can't imagine ordinary family life. Like what they see on TV is Mardi Gras. Or men in chat, you know, they, they don't see you eating your cornflakes in the morning and going off to work. They just don't have an image of ordinary family life. And because of that, they do worry that the kids, they worry about the kids. They worry that the kids are gonna be teased in school. They worry that the kids aren't gonna get the sort of you know, there's a lot of nostalgia here too. They worry that the kids are not going to get that kind of happy, rounded, innocent childhood that they had. And I think even though they're very well mean, they wouldn't judge these kids, there is an element of feeling sorry for them. And that, when you say there's no evidence that the kids aren't okay, um, even though what we're talking about is, you know, <coughs> tiny differences in these well-being measures, really, across samples that may or may not have been ran, like it just, it's almost meaningless data, but it has been repeated many, many times. Kids are fine. I think there are certain people that want to see that evidence and actually do listen to it, um, particularly people who are sort of from science professions, who are from health professions. So for us, I guess the challenge is about contextualising that evidence. It's about speaking about what, that, what assumptions you're making when you ask for that evidence and fitting it into some sort of education program in a way that has meaning, but doesn't you know, it doesn't just dismiss it. The, the, there's a role for that evidence, but it's a, politically, it's a tricky, it's a tricky line to tread, I guess, when presenting it. 
Um, but just for the record, the kids are fine. Um, look, I think that's that's all I have to say, really. I can, honestly, programs like Safe Schools are really important. We know that. But I think there is a slightly different context for rainbow families that they may or may not pick up on entirely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the benefit of the live stream, uh, that was Jennifer Power from La Trobe University. Um, I'd now like to welcome up Dr Lucy Nicholas from Swinburne University, talking on Safe Schools Coalition and Enabling Relationality. Um, and for those who came in late, we're going to, the whole panel will talk and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. Thank you, Luke. And thank you, Jen. I'm going to try and segue from your paper. Oh, good. Um, because I think some of the things that you spoke to there are, are really key in that when you become a parent and when your child enters a school, you become part of the whole community. You can't help it, right? So I'm here in my capacity from the, from the very grounded to the totally ephemeral. I'm a theorist. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I've tried to be really practical here. But I'm talking in my capacity as a social theorist, I suppose. Um, and I want to address the elephant in the room, which is uh, queer theory or radical cultural Marxist agendas. Um, <laughs> and I think that I've always worked in queer ethics um, and thinking about how we can create a whole community ethos of, of understanding each other in these lovely queer ways, which I think that maybe these programs are trying to foster um, this capacity of the whole community to, to understand each other in these lovely open ways. Um, and I think that these kind of whole community, whole school approaches like the Safe Schools Coalition, and there's other programs that I'm gonna talk about internationally, I think they're doing that really effectively. And I guess I wanna talk a little bit about some of the premises of that and some of the, the theoretical underpinnings of that and theoretical ways of understanding that. Um, and I suppose I wanna talk about the kind of more insipid stuff that you were talking about. So you were saying the bullying is almost more easy to deal with. It's, it's more the anxiety around the culture of the school being exclusionary. And I think that that stuff's much more difficult to address. Um, and it's much more challenging when people do try, try to address it. And that's kind of where the backlash comes from. When you start asking the broader community to adjust, that's when the backlash comes, which we've seen. So I want to talk about um, that approach. That I'm going to use a laser pointer just because I'm excited. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the affirmation um, approach, which <clears throat> Barry talked about yesterday actually in the gender stream, the kind of affirmative approach. And you were talking about that too, that a lot of people were talking in that survey about feeling invisible. So the affirmative approach goes beyond tolerance, beyond anti-bullying, towards an actual affirmation of diversity. Um, and then I want to talk about what a queer ethics might look like, what this kind of ideal, I'm such a utopian thinker, right? I can't help it, and it's so abstract and silly, but um, someone has to do it. And so I want to think about what this ideal queer ethic would look like, what it would look like for us to be able to relate to one another queerly. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about this new trajectory I'm trying to take in my work, which is how can we foster this positive queer way of relating to one another? And I found this new concept in social psychology. So I'm just going to like really arrogantly make my way into social psychology and start using this <laughs> concept of allophilia, which are, or allophilia, I don't know how you say that loud which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, which is about how we can actually foster positive uh, ways of reading one another. So, um, it's not really um, that crazy to claim that there are much greater negative responses to pushes for change when those changes require more than tolerance, right? So, so many theorists in political theory, social theory, have written about tolerance and its, its limits. So, in Melbourne, at Melbourne Uni, you've got Gassan Haj, who wrote uh, White Nation, and he talks about the way that multiculturalism is a model of tolerance that's really about um, the majority culture being able to talk about the minority culture, making them objects of discussion rather than subjects themselves. So this is what we're kind of seeing in the safe schools backlash, that the shift has become a shift of 
responsibility to the majority culture. The majority culture is being asked to interrogate itself. Schools, whole school approaches are asking everybody to think about their own heteronormativity, right? And the heterosexism in school materials. And that is causing blind panic. So tolerance can deal with these, these more overt things, the, the more overt bullying that Jen was talking about, like transphobia, homophobia, sexism, racism. It can account for that stuff and it can attempt to deal with that stuff, but it can't so easily account for the more insipid stuff like cis normativity and this term that I'm obsessed with by genderism, which is kind of the assumption Yara and I are like really obsessed with this term. <laughs> um, if we don't say it three times a day, something. <laughs> um, but, but these more insipid things, so cis normativity, the assumption that everybody's gender is congruent with the sexes they were assigned at birth, by genderism, the assumption that there are only two genders. Heteronormativity, male supremacy, ethnocentrism, white supremacy. I love all these terms because, and I love teaching them to my undergrad students because they explain the more normative thinking that isn't about intentional discrimination, it's about this culture of normativity, which is what you were talking about before. And it's much more difficult to address, much more difficult. But people are trying and people are doing this amazing work, but the way it's being received is as an attack on normativity, right? So you have people like, Kevin Donnelly, who, who works here, saying, writing in the media about how uh, the all of us materials from safe schools um, are attacking heterosexual people. They're attacking people who choose to be heterosexual, he said. So I think that, oh yeah, here we are, we have it at the bottom. So in reference to, so the Safe Schools Do Better book that talks about the concept of heterosexism. So it head on tackles this much more interesting and important concept of heterosexism, of normalizing heterosexuality. And Donnelly suggested that that means that anyone expressing a preference for heterosexuality is a tech. So that very idea that even interrogating normativity is an attack on normativity. And you see that in any kind of approach that goes beyond tolerance. So the same thing happens, I was talking at the homo, it's not called that, is it? Was the Homo year. Histories Conference? This year was called that. Okay. I was talking at the Homo Histories Conference uh, last week and talking about other affirmative approaches such as, or like approaches that go beyond tolerance that require the whole community to do work. So I was talking about when people don't reveal the sex of their child or, um, I can't remember, oh, no gender November or December rather. No gender December, <laughs> all months. No gender December, which was talking about uh, not using stereotypical gendered toys. And these kind of approaches that ask the broader community always get this, this fearful backlash. So with the gender neutral child rearing stuff, we see newspapers, for example, in their, uh, in their coverage of it, bringing child psychologists in to say, well, the children need to know their roles. They need to know their roles, rather than critiquing the roles themselves. Um, so tolerance is one thing. Tolerance is fine, but tolerance can't deal with this more affirmative approach, which the, the evidence, the actual empirical research that you use, shows that that, that is required, that, that people are still finding that they, they're feeling an anxiety about the, the culture that they're living within, the context and the culture that they're living within. And I really like, I'm gonna have to use the mouse now. I tried to put, take photos of like joyful queer people. <laughs> uh, Lisa Duggan, she says, she talks about homonormativity, right? And she says that the kind of tolerance approach, the anti-homophobia tolerance approach, lets the larger society off the hook of anxiety. And I love that quote because it puts all the responsibility on, on the minority group. So as you were saying, you know, being the queer parent, being the person that takes the book in, that lets the larger society off the hook of anxiety. They don't have to do anything. Um, and then I'm really into queer pedagogy, which I only just discovered, but everybody else has been working in for years. Um, and this is, a fairly joyous Britsman saying that, um, you know, that tolerance approach, <coughs> this is such a big, a big quote, sorry, but she's saying that um, when, when it's reduced to homophobia, she says the limitations produced when gay and lesbian subjects are reduced to the problem of remedying homophobia, a conceptualization that stalls within a humanist psychological discourse of individual fear of homosexuality as abject contagion, she says that that shuts out an examination of how the very term homophobia as a discourse centers heterosexuality as the normal. So that's the same thing as um, Hajj's account of 
multiculturalism, that the very kind of framing of um, tolerance uh, in the multicultural discourses, that that centers whiteness as the normal or Anglo culture as the normal. And then that makes the minority group the, the object to be talked about by the majority culture. So there's an inherent problem in that whole framework, that whole approach, which while strategically has some massive benefits from overt bullying and overt uh, hatred, is still not quite there, you know? Um, and I just love this article. Stop reading straight, it's so good. <laughs> um, so it's not really news. This is a sociology conference, and it's not really news to us that we are shaped socially to perceive the world in certain <laughs> ways, right? So, <clears throat> I mean, in contested ways, people have different accounts of how we're shaped, but I really like this literary metaphor. So this is from like a queer <coughs> literary theorist, Kubowitz, who uses this literary metaphor of the default reader. And I really like this way of thinking about how we're reading one another. And in a school context or in any kind of community context, people have these default reading settings. So for example, where people can therefore like pass as a single parent family in order to tap into the default readings so that they don't have to do that hard work of, of reprogramming somebody's readings on a Monday morning when you're cranky at night like, um, Or every morning when you're cranky at night like me. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I think, I'm gonna bring in Judith Butler so we can do the, the queer bingo. Bingo! Um, <laughs> We had one yesterday, one mention. Mm -hmm. Identi she, she says identities are leg legitimacy like, collectively. This is my paraphrasing of her. So the people that we interact with need the cultural resources to read us how we want to be read, right? Um, to make us intelligible. So I can go about saying I'm non-binary, but if somebody doesn't know what non-binary is, they're not going to read me as non-binary because they, they have a default reading setting of bi-genderism or two genders. So it doesn't matter what I say I am people are going to read me according to the, the resources that they have from growing up. Um, so we're constantly being co-constituted by the people we interact with and by the context we live in, which is not a new thing to say, but it's super important to, this, to thinking about this issue. So Kubowitz says that the default reader has fundamental parameters or default settings owing to their embeddedness in the specific socio-cultural political context or matrix of which they are a part. So the assumption is that unless indicated otherwise, a person shares these default settings with the surrounding overall matrix and expects the reader to do the same. So if most people have the same default settings, they're going to override your minority settings that you know about and your family might know about, but nobody else in that community knows about. And then that ends up making you do all this hard work. Um, <clears throat> So with this kind of idea, we can hypothesize that a really big problem for like sexually and gender diverse peeps is in schools in particular where people are explicitly and implicitly constantly being taught modes of reading one another. It's like, I think all of these programs are premised on the idea that these whole school models are premised on the idea that um, othering is an inherent result of these default reading settings, that you're going to get othered because of these pre predefined preset default readings. So people either fit you into their pre-existing settings, resulting in pressure to just be like, oh, whatever. Or if they oppose your settings, there's like a backlash response. So I think that the they pronoun is a really good example of a cultural resource that's being collectively created, but it causes one of two things to happen. One is like really strange arguments about grammar, um, <laughs> being much more important than people's sense of self. Um, and the other is just actual, absolute confusion. So that's an example of an a community introducing a new cultural resource. And we've seen new cultural resources being introduced in history. That's how identities are recreated. So I think it's probably going to be much more acceptable soon. But we're seeing that the teasing problems of a new cultural resource coming about and how hard it is for people to change their default settings. So I've moaned a lot. What, what can we do to <laughs> override these default settings? <laughs> big bad queer theory. <laughs> um, I'm performing for the camera. <laughs> um, big bad queer theory. So um, uh, okay. we 
my theory. <clears throat> I work in the field of queer ethics, so as I just said, I've just done a lot of deconstructive talk, right? Talking about the problem. But I think queer theory is an inherently ethical project. I think it, it lends itself to like a, a reconstructive agenda program. By deconstructing normative sexuality and gender, I think queer theory is inherently utopian and calling for something, something better. So you have critics such as Kevin Donnelly from the ACU School of Education and Arts um, <laughs> saying that <laughs> whole school programs, another staff member from ACU, not arts and arts, arts and arts. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's what it said on the website. The faculty, but we were very different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Saying <laughs> that um, the Safe Schools Coalition, which is a whole school approach, or has been a whole school approach in the past, is promoting a radical view of gender and sexuality based on the belief that a percentage of students are same sex attracted, intersex, and gender <coughs> diverse. Um, and then additionally, we have, I forgot his name, which is great, Shelton. Um, from Australian Christian Lobby calling um, these kind of programs suggesting that they're based on contested gender ideology. So we know that we have the empirical evidence based on excellent methodologies to underpin the facts that these kind of programs are based on the truth that 15% of young people are not exclusively same-sex attracted or cisgender. And I think queer theory actually <coughs> lends itself to a really exciting strategy for challenging default readings, default settings, um, and for enabling all students and all members of communities. I oh. have four minutes left. Gee whiz. Okay. Um, because we are constituted by other people and by the groups we're in, my work's recently shifted, I can't really talk about my work, has recently <laughs> shifted to looking at what how we can practically um, foster a diversity perspective. So a perspective that the whole of the community has, which is open to diversity in a limitless way. We don't have to restrict it to gay, lesbian, trans, but a general openness to diversity. Um, and what I think is really important about these kind of approaches, these whole school, whole community approaches, is that they actually are evidenced to be beneficial to all members of communities, all members of schools or communities because it helps all individuals to feel secure in who they are. By interrogating your own identity, by looking at how you came to understand yourself according to normative frames, you then are able to get a, a great sense of ontological security. Um, so challenging heterosexism not only helps to break down the norms that confine everybody to rigid gender role stereotypes, but also encourages students to develop critical thinking skills to question presumptions and biases they encounter throughout their lives. And there are programs like this in existence. So in the UK, we had no, oh, I just lasered you, I'm sorry. No <laughs> Outsiders, which was a program in the UK, which was a whole school approach to primary education. And in the US, there was a program called Students for a Meaningful Solution. I think this is a particularly awesome example of a program that wasn't specifically about talking about a minority group. It didn't name this program as a program to, to target and create tolerance for a minority group. It was a, an empowerment program for all school members. Um, it was described as a youth empowerment program with new approaches to transform bullying and empower youth. And the strategy is aimed at bullies, victims, and bystanders. So that's everybody. The self, the other people you're interacting with who might be bullying you, and then the, the whole community, the bystanders. Um, and the process that it went through was for the students to interrogate the whole mindset and way of interacting and offering students new resources, cultural resources I call them, for understanding themselves, others and, and the world. And I think these kind of approaches which, which tackle the mindsets of the entire community are going to have a much longer lasting impact than those that just take the band-aid approach. Um, and this is where this theory of autophilia that I don't have time to talk about comes in, which is this beautiful concept in social psychology, which is not some two things we hear together very often. Um, and it's this approach, social psychology has always been about prejudice reduction. Why, where does prejudice come from? How can we get rid of prejudice? And it's always talked about in groups and out groups. And I've always found that really problematic. But this concept is about cultivating positive regard 
or allophilia, which means love for the other. So instead of just tackling over prejudice between two specified groups, it's about fostering this whole mindset of love for otherness, of openness to otherness and not fear of otherness. Um, and this kind of speaks to the, uh, the more ally-based approaches which look at people's privilege and interrogate privilege. And under here, there's somebody who uses this concept um, talks about how it focuses on values, increasing understanding of privilege and its role in oppression, and cultivating empathy in the in-group or privileged group. So they're still using that in-group, out-group language, but I think this notion of everybody cultivating empathy and understanding of privilege is a wonderful idea. So to conclude then, these kind of approaches um, lead to positive outcomes for everybody, for people with privilege and for those without privilege in the current, current matrix, I guess. And I'm just going to leave us with a quote from Kevin Donnelly in The Australian here, who says, <laughs> on my behalf, welcome to the brave new world of gender diversity where biology no longer matters as one's gender is simply a socio-cultural construct. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thank you, Lucy. Uh, next up we have Associate Professor oh, Tiffany yeah. Jones uh, from UNE and from La Trobe, um, talking about safe or safer schools and families for students with intersex variations. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> thank you. Escape. Escape. <laughs> thank you. Such a helpful word. Um, yay. <laughs> in a way from Kevin Donnelly <laughs> in your talk he talks about um, biology not being meaningful because um, my talk um, is very much interested in biology um, but also our social view of it um, and I guess I wanted to start it off by asking you a question of how could you know that I'm a woman just feel free to <laughs> If I say so, that's a wonderful answer. <laughs> so there's um, the social um, construction of myself as having agency um, and being able to claim an identity as a woman. And that's one thing that's very widely acknowledged in sociology. It's important to that. Very good. You're Are there other things? Been, you're totally presenting as My been. presentation. So mm -hmm. it might be, do you mean like, Shoes, hair, hair shoes. shoes. Clothes, skirt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I might dress. I might dress as a woman or present it as a woman, um, and that I guess we'd also acknowledge in a sociological frame um, as having social, socially specific aspects to the time and place I'm from. I won't be offended. You can yell stuff out. <laughs> I have a higher voice. I have a higher voice. So there's um, something biological somewhat to it, um, as well as our social association of a higher voice. I, I really do have a higher voice. It's higher than this, I've got a cold. <laughs> so this is like a very white version of what I'm normally putting out, so I'm glad you can actually understand me today. <laughs> but yeah, I do have a higher voice, short of vocal cords, um, which is affected um, often by hormones as well. Um, generally your hormones can help determine the voice. So. So a man might have a higher voice as well um, with certain hormones, but it might be something you associate with that identity category. Secondary sexual characteristics. My secondary sexual characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess we could talk about, I, I personally don't have facial hair, although that's not true. <laughs> I did have a stress hair this morning because <laughs> I was coming to um, the Catholic University to talk about it. <laughs> so I plucked it out of my nose. So sometimes I do have <laughs> facial hair. But generally, we associate less facial hair with women. Although, you know, menopause, 
And there's women who have beards. There's women, you know, we sometimes see in the media um, really terrible coverage of women who have beards for hormonal reasons. Um, I have breasts, um, but men can have breasts. <laughs> men can have <laughs> Well, I'm not making accusations. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, you know, I mean, all the men here do have um, glands in the same spot as me and nipples. Even though they're redundant for men, they can't necessarily breastfeed with them. In many cases, in some cases they can though, so I guess, hmm, we can't quite... Progesterone pills will do it. <laughs> Progesterone yeah. pills? That's about six weeks. So you could look at what medication I take and what, what hormones I take. That might be a way that you'd be able to make assumptions. What else? Your first name? Naming, definitely. So the social culture of giving someone a name definitely can have an impact on how we're seen. Although I think of that song, a boy named Sue. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, like, I guess the point I'm trying to make, and nobody went for the genitals. I was hoping <laughs> someone would be brave and say, show us what you've got. But um, <laughs> nobody did, because people don't do that, do they, in real life? Um, you don't generally have to. Not here. Yeah, <laughs> and I might not be that lucky that people want to see my genitals, really, but... um. whether they've taken hormones or, or whether they were born with X chromosome, XY chromosomes, they can be born with a vagina, uh, much like mine, um, which I won't show you, um, <laughs> and vice versa. So that, what I, the point I'm trying to make is there's no one test that you can give me, whether it's my name, my hair, um, my, my choice, that's part of it, but there's no one there's no one measure for my sex. There's lots of measures, and all of them, even though they might have biological elements, are also to do with social um, assumptions about about what sex we'd we'd allocate on the basis of that trait. So I want us to start thinking about biology. Yes, acknowledging biology, but thinking about it in a more socially complica complicated and complex sociological way. <laughs> um, Let's do this talk. So first of all, I want to acknowledge an enormous range of people because I have to say right up front, I'm not a person with an intersex variation to my knowledge. Um, I've been tested because I was curious doing this research, but a lot of people who do have intersex variations or groups that support them have supported the research. And I think it's really important when you're not the insider of a group and you're studying them to involve those groups and those people and their goals. And that's why a lot of us academics, you can hear some tension that they've had at certain academics speaking out about issues that they haven't studied because they don't consult with us and because they don't um, research us and they just express opinions. So I'm very much trying to involve people in this work. Thank you, everyone there. Um, <laughs> so people with intersex variations are born with what's called atypical somatic physical, bodily, sex characteristics, whether they're chromosomal, so it might be somebody who is otherwise fitting biological char characteristics of female but has XY chromosomes or XXY chromosomes or X, just X, you can sometimes just have an X, there's um, XXYY, <laughs> there's so many variations they didn't tell you about it at school, if you want to read about them you can read in my other published work, I can't go through them all now. Um, hormonal variations, so you might um, be an XX um, person with, with a vagina and breasts and la la la, but have hormones that sort of take you into um, having maybe the second, secondary sex characteristics normally allocated to a male, um, or the deeper voice, <laughs> which I so crave. <laughs> um, or it might be your anatomical features. Um, and there's, there's over 40 types of intersex variations, but I'm sure there's more than what we know. Um, so examples are androgen insensitivity, complete androgen insensitivity, partial androgen insensitivity, ambiguous genitalia, um, yeah, 47XXY, Kleinfelder's um, congenital or genal hyperplasia, and so on. Um, so we have potential for both male and female sex traits in our first seven weeks in utero. 
And I think that's really not talked about enough. Um, so in those first seven weeks, and this is where the, the, the men having nipples thing comes in, <laughs> um, you know, the, in the womb, the fetus, um, the fetus has the potential to develop gonads, which could end up ovaries or could end up um, testes or could end up somewhere in between. People have one of each sometimes. So we all have that potential when we're in the room. Um, we all have potential to trigger different hormones. Um, we all have potential in the womb and for our chromosomes to still produce a different kind of body to the one they did produce. So again, there's no one way in which our sex traits created our sex. Just because you have certain chromosomes doesn't mean you necessarily followed a certain path. Um, but after that point, it's, it's estimated that roughly, you know, two to four percent of people are actually born into sex. Um, I'd say that's a conservative estimate because it ignores that people with polycystic ovary syndrome sometimes have a, a hyperandrogenism where they have all the secondary sex characteristics we were discussing um, associated with men, even though they're born as women. Although sometimes people are born as men and have polycystic ovary syndrome, this is what I'm trying to say, it's quite complicated. So I think we don't even have the full numbers on the people with intersex variations, but that's, that's the statistic I can give for now. Um, people with intersex variations have a non-discrimination right in all Australian schools, and there's no exemptions for religious schools, unlike um, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And I think that's where we start to see that um, when people are concerned about change, they're less concerned about change, that can make a basis in biology in some way. It's less confronting, so there just hasn't been as much hoo-ha about that. Um, however, I did a survey of 272 people with intersex variations in 2015, um, and 18% of the participants had had early school dropout. 18%. And that's a really huge number, considering that it's illegal in Australia um, to drop out <laughs> of school, like you have to stay until 16 or 17, depending on the state. It was a, it was um, cross cross state national survey, um, and you know you compare that to two percent of Australians, for example, or four percent of transgender people in another study I've done. So that's huge. It's huge that that many people are dropping out before they even get their school certificate if they have intersex variations. Now, um, I did an article where I argued that this was somewhat tied to disruption from corrective medical interventions, because when you have traits that aren't easily allocated, a clear-cut sex according to biological assumptions of the two sexes, or by genderism, <laughs> just that like throw you a break, <laughs> um, then sometimes people try and correct these kids, and it's quite often the majority had had at least one or two in medical interventions. And when I say what a medical intervention is, it's often cosmetic in, in the first couple of years, correcting of their genitalia. Because if their genitalia sort of wasn't long enough to be considered a penis or wasn't um, small enough to be considered a clitoris or wasn't deep enough to be considered a vagina, like it was somewhere in between because of different hormonal variations, <coughs> there were attempts at fixing them, which don't help you go to school. <laughs> Um, a lot of kids are saying things like, I was bleeding out of my genital, you know, for a month or two and I didn't want to go to school. And then I dropped out and then I fell behind and I couldn't tell people why and they all thought I was a bludger and just, you know, it's really complicated. So I thought that that was part of the dropping out, but I did not explore the impact of family and education-based relationships, which is what we're talking about today. So, um, the lens that I use, um, is, is sociological research, and, and I'm really trying to respond to the lack of sociological research in this area. Um, most of the studies in this area have been small-scale medical studies, and when I say small-scale, I'm talking one or two people with intersex variations have been studied, and they get a paper out of it. Um, amazing, <laughs> amazingly small for sociologists to think about that. Um, <coughs> And they mainly are done in clinics, and they're mainly framing these people as having a disorder of sex development, so not even using the term I'm using. Um, and they're doing the sort of tests like DNA tests, buccal smears, genital measuring, I mean, awful tests. <laughs> so um, in some ways I feel like apologising to this group as a re 
researcher that um, a lot of this has been done without their permission. Um, a lot of the studies that I look at have photos of, of kids' genitals. With, I mean, the kid, you know, is, is an infant, couldn't possibly give their permission, and it's available for free on the internet now. You can see it with someone holding it, with their bare hand. Like, there's, there's really horrible research, so I really wanted to address it with a sociological study, seeing these people's people. Um, you know, a few of our critical LGBTI studies, um, this is something I did with Lizzie, you know, we've included some, or attended to include in some people with intersex variations, but it can be difficult. And what we came to realise was we really needed to have a study just on people with intersex variations because they're so hard to include in LGBTI studies because their concerns can be different. Um, because in finding out that you're intersex, you're generally finding out from someone else telling you in a medical situation rather than going and telling people about yourself, which is more the LGBT way, if you know what I mean, or, or coming to a realisation about yourself and saying it out loud. So it's very different. So we developed, um, I developed with some people in those groups, including Gabby Sara, um, Morgan Carpenter, Bonnie Hart, and others, um, an inter-studies framework, intersex studies framework, based on the goals, perspectives, and experiences of people with intersex variations and their representatives. So they wanted me to study their relationships, how they were treated at school, all that sort of stuff, you know, stuff about being a person. Um, and I guess the frame privileged whole scale reform, it was towards activism, and it accepted them as a marginalised group whose bodily rights to their own, steering their own ship about their body, is basically what I would call it, um, was under threat. And, I, and we considered how social constructions of their bodies could be accepted and, and medical orthodoxy challenged. That's what they want if you're going to study this group, that's what they want you to consider. Um, this paper considers education and family relationships um, from their underrepresented perspective of the people with intersex variations themselves. And I'm asking how do these relationships impact on safety in the school years um, for this group? Um, so I'm looking at, re-looking at a survey of 272 Australians born with congenital variations in their sex characteristics. Um, when I did the survey, I also included all those other terms because some people might see it as other terms. Um, the participants were aged 16 to 85, 4% Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. 52% were allocated female at birth, 41% male. Um, however, fewer now use male as their allocated sex. So, and, and not necessarily as transgender, like often because they felt that they got it wrong in their assessment of their physical sex traits. So it's sl slightly different to being transgender. 27% have disabilities. Um, I'm just going to move qu more quickly. So 64% of the participants learn that their variations are aged under 18. So majority are learning in the time that they're in the schooling years. Um, they were generally told by their parents or a doctor at home or in the car or around or during a tense medical appointment. That was how they found out. With inadequate information and generally little or no follow-up ever again. Um, <coughs> Their relatives in this situation who share their variation, um, the majority said none or they were unsure. So um, in talking about rainbow families and LGBTI, um, sometimes people might think they're the only person in their family, but what we do know from medical studies is that actually intersex variations are more often than not um, hereditary. So a lot of people don't know that they're actually in a family with hereditary links. This is how isolated from their own family members this, these people are. So interfamily secrecy around whether or not relatives have variations and how they experience them was a really strong theme in the qualitative data. A typical comment, and I'm not using individual quotes today because I was nervous about media like oh, doing something awful to intersex individuals, but a typical comment was that they had no idea if they were expressed in their family, intersex variations. There were also instances where they were unsure because they strongly suspected that someone actually had physical traits that are in, related to having an intersex variation. They could physically see the person, <laughs> probably did, but it could never be confirmed. They weren't allowed to talk about it. There was a lot of secrecy. Don't ask Uncle Joe about this thing. Um, or people had passed away. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, people often struggle to share information in this context of silence in their own family. Another 
reported that there was, another person reported there was an atmosphere of tension around her chromosomal variation and she explained that it prevented her finding out if there were others. I mean, it's chromosomal, <laughs> so probably. Um, but there's just no way she could even ask. There were siblings who had aunts with um, androgen sensitivities and so on. But they were the exception, the ones he knew. So I guess 44% reported counselling or pressure to act more feminine or more masculine. Um, and of the comments on these experiences, it included pressure to become a normal woman, wear dresses and hair, so all the things we're talking about that might be indicators to you that I am socially a woman, um, they're being pressured to do, even if that's not how they feel, and some of them even feel male. Um, so learn to do gymnastic duties and hobbies, become physically capable of penetrative sex was a big one, that was often pressure from doctors. Um, one day you're going to need to be a good wife. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And the same with, with pressures to be masculine. Um, it was about physical characteristics, going to the gym, being unemotional as well, um, clothing, behaviour, all of that. I won't go into it too long because I don't have a lot of time. Um, another pressure, though, that I wanted to say that this group faces other group, that other group, groups don't is sometimes they don't go through puberty as quickly or ever or in the same way, and they get a lot of pressure to grow up, to start dating, and they might just feel much like a young person does and just want to watch cartoons and things, especially if they have Corman's or Turner's or certain um, conditions. So, support. Um, my main point here is that participants were asked who they told and who knew, um, and you can see at the very bottom here, um, principals and priests <laughs> and teachers were least likely to know, um, and doctors and friends were most likely to know. Um, maybe one of the parents was someone they could talk to. But when you look at the support, um, school staff and students were the least supportive. So that was a really big problem. Um, unsupportive is in green. So this is teachers, classmates, principals, you can see they're the, the most likely to be unsupportive and the least likely to be supportive in blue. Um, whereas, whereas, you know, the parent was somewhat supportive, but the big support was the friend. 95% were not offered counselling in their school that affirmed <coughs> people with intersex variations. And a third overall weighted their overall experiences with school negatively. Um, so bad or very bad. Um, so that's, there's a portion of these students who are doing okay and a portion who are, who are finding school really difficult and potentially dropping out. Um, you know, 77 described being bullying, perpetrators and mainly students and occasionally staff. Um, most of them described their variation not being known or talked about or mentioned by anyone. Um, and there was 11 participants who described good experiences, and good experiences for them were the ability to be open, social support, a lack of discrimination, and teachers encouraging the students to do projects on their variation. But it mainly happened at Union TAFE, not at school. So that's what good support looks like for them. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say overall is that this group, unlike the first group where we were talking about rainbow families and there's, there's, there's parents trying to create a context of support, and, and it's so beautiful, and maybe to hear Jen talk about how, how she tries to do good things for her family, and she thinks about it deeply, what it means. For this group, um, family relationships aren't, they're very fraught, they're very fraught, they aren't um, open as much, and, and family members may have experienced discrimination about being intersex, they don't even want their own kids to know, or their niece and nephew, or whoever. Okay, so they're not getting support at home. They're having difficulty in medical contexts because they're often being physically changed before they're even of age to give permission for that to happen. So those are two locations where I don't think we can disseminate information on intersex variations safely or rely on information and support for this group. Um, but what happened at home and in clinics impacted the school outcomes and poor relationships at school, which we saw were pretty terrible anyway, were made worse. And that's when people were dropping out. Bullying and silence means that individual information dissemination requiring you to come out as intersex at school isn't going to work. If you come out as intersex at school, you, you're at risk of bullying. 
um, and, and there's just so much secrecy, that's not going to happen. So that's not going to be how we give out information about this. It's not going to be just to the kids who have an intersex variation. So my argument is that to aid kids with intersex variations and improve students' general knowledge of sex traits, sort of in a similar way to just how we did today, talking about, talking about sex traits, it is most logical and safe to generally disseminate and discuss information about intersex variations in school science, PDHPE, sex education, puberty education. I could run, like I did just before with you, a little session with some students. I used to be a teacher, just like that, and that would be how we had the discussion. You know, but someone would have said vagina. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> Kids aren't scared to say the V word. Um, so, you know, it's quite simple to do. Do you know what I mean? And, and they would have been educated and actually had more knowledge, more scientific knowledge by the end of that session about sex and about sex traits and biology. So, I mean, why are we dumbing it down for kids? I don't understand. So I would, I would find that a very fascinating thing to learn in school. And it would help people who had an intersex variation silently feel like, oh, there I am. I'm part of this group. We're all part of this group. Anyone could have ended up like me with this variation. I can see how it all works now. And I'm part of this and I'm here and I'm welcome. So sending home information about body variations and puberty experiences may also help families to understand and wouldn't hurt as well. So while I'm at it, while I'm telling the world. <laughs> um, so, you know, even if, even if a family doesn't have a kid with intersex variations in it, because we know that is rare, um, it might help the family understand biological sex, what's biological and what's sociological about it, um, how complex it is, and destigmatise difference um, for safer homes and safer schools. Thank you. <laughs>
so this hasn't been peer reviewed <laughs> it's just for today and um i don't know maybe tiffany or someone would like to write an article on it in the future <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for this survey, um, for the development of the survey back in 2012-2013, um, the research team along with the community um, advisory group made up of transgender and gender diverse people, um, uh, including young people, uh, had a look to see what kinds of school provision we felt um, uh, impacted um, young people and what made inclusive school environments for young uh, gender diverse and transgender young people. So this included um, looking at the international research, the expertise of the researchers including Tiffany who has a um, solid education background and also the experiences of, um, from Safe Schools Victoria and, and the experiences of community advisory groups. So they came up with 14, or we came up with 14. Um, so I assume everyone's had a read, I won't go through them all. Um, so these were, so for this, for this um, presentation, um, they work well together. So they were all, they were all asked in, uh, can you tell us um, if you're, I think it's in the next one actually, sorry. Okay, at my school or my most recent school there was there is or was appropriate provision for me and my gender expression in terms of these things. Um, so as you can see, sexuality education got the least. So this is for the whole participant group of 189. Um, Counselling services or, link, or links was interesting as the highest. Uh, when that was looked at in terms of age, there was an age bias and was more likely to include the younger people. So that's, you know, a positive good thing that's the shift that's happening. Um, so I should mention that the young people are aged between 14 and 25. Okay, so in order to answer those earlier questions, I looked at, I'll just go back again. So these, these percentages here are for people who answered that they were mostly appropriate. Okay, so for the people who answered that those different provisions were mostly appropriate for them, I grouped them into participants who scored four or less as mostly appropriate, participants who scored five to eight as mostly appropriate, and participants who scored nine to 13 as mostly appropriate. Now that, the differentiation that I, that's just my, just some kind of arbitrary line that I've drawn, so I'll talk about further research that needs to be done later on. Um, it's also each of those provisions have been weighted equally as well, so that might not actually translate in the real world. And so I also think there should be some more research about that too. Uh, one thing to note is that the, all of these um, all of these provisions are something that, that can be done by schools. So it's not necessarily um, just about uh, sort of lack of bullying, things like that. It's actual policies and procedures that can be put in place. Okay, so 60% of the participants scored four or less as mostly appropriate, 30% as medium and 10% as high. So that's out of 129 who answered that at least one of those provisions was mostly appropriate. So there's some data missing there too, which I'll talk about later. Okay, so. <coughs> so for this, um, this preliminary extra analysis, these results are, oh, sorry, as I mentioned, be collapsed. Okay, so all of these um, relationships that you see here is statistically significant to um, less than 0.05 probability that they've been produced by random error. Okay, so there were others where there looked like there was relationships because the percentages did decrease as the young person's provisions went up. <laughs> um, but these are the ones that were statistically significant. Okay, so they're more likely to have experienced verbal abuse or harassment, more likely to have experienced social exclusion, 
more likely to have experienced discriminatory language from friends, more likely not to be able to concentrate in class as a result of bullying or harassment, more likely to have thought about self-harm, and more likely to have thought about suicide. And as you can see, the differences between the low and the high are really quite stark. Less so between the high and the middle. Okay, so this is when I looked at um, young people, whether they were in low, medium or high provisions and the, the support that they got from their friends and family. So we also asked young people to, to, um, to tell us if they felt mostly supported or mostly unsupported by different people in their lives. Um, so for this presentation, it's just looking at these ones. Um, obviously when we get to teachers and things like that, there's also that relationship there that you really make. Um, so what's interesting, I think, is that friends, there's a little bit going on here. Extended family, not a lot. Siblings, hardly anything. But parents, yes. <coughs> no. So I think what Jen was saying earlier when she started her talk about choosing a school that was, <laughs> you know, known as somewhere where um, there were other lesbian gay parents, um, then you might have some kind of effect happening there as well, possibly. But I don't know, because you know these are just relationships and they're not necessarily causal, as I'm sure you understand. Okay, so I think I have depression. Um, young people who reported that they had a lower level of inclusive and appropriate provisions at their school uh, were more likely to tell us that they felt that they had depression. Uh, so nearly 50%. Um, and as you can see, medium, there's not much difference. And then when we get to high, there's quite a lot. Okay, so then when we <coughs> looked at, well, what about the young people who felt that their parents were supportive or unsupportive? Did that make any kind of difference? So the one that's in the middle, um, that was the total. No, sorry, this one's the total, this one's supportive, and this one's unsupportive. So this is what we just looked at before. So as you can see, when we get to um, young people who are in schools with low provisions and have unsupportive parents, 75% tell us that they think they have depression. And then there's a similar effect in the middle one as well. Okay, but we f I found um, something quite different when we, we got to, um, I think I have stress. So as you can see, similar numbers, a little bit higher, I think, for young people who have stress. There's a relationship again with school provisions. When we get to parents, um, we do have higher amounts feeling stress who also tell us that their parents are mostly unsupportive. But then when we get to the group in the middle, we have an opposite thing occurring. So I'm not too sure what's happening there, but um, yeah, something to think about. Okay, not surprisingly, bullying on social media. Um, so the first column is just bullying on social media in general compared to these three levels. Second, supportive. So as you can see, young people who had supportive parents are less likely to experience bullying on social media compared to those who have unsupportive parents. There could be lots of different reasons for that. Um, like Jane was saying, we, um, you know, one could, or, or, sorry, no, I think it was Lucy who was talking about resilience and, and somebody was talking just about sort of building a culture of um, acceptance and understanding and, and how that might also sort of help ward off those kinds of bullying. Um, and then obviously the opposite, if you have unsupportive parents, it could also be the supportive parent is more involved in a person's online presence. <laughs> I don't know. 
but um, yeah, an interesting relationship nevertheless. Okay, so there were many statistically significant differences between the young people with the mid, um, the low, mid and high school provision scores and mental health, uh, general wellbeing and experiences of harassment. Um, some of these were mediated by support or carers, as we spoke about. There was a relationship between sports support from parents and carers and the school provision score. There were no young people with a high, um, what I've termed a high provision, school provision score, but you know, I'm just making this up as we go along, so. <laughs> but I think you know what I'm talking about. Who felt that their parents were unsupportive. So there were, there were none in that, in that group. Young people were most likely to tell us that they think they have depression if they had a low school provision score and their parents, carers were mostly unsupportive. So again, I think we can see there's, you know, it's it's always multi-dimensional and it's not just about schools, it's not just about parents. So, you know, um, and there's a relationship between those two that doesn't extend to extended family or, or so much friends, a little bit maybe, but, um, or siblings. So I think, yeah, I think that's quite an interesting finding. Um, and what we just talked about, the young, uh, young people supporting families were less likely to be bullied on social media. The last point is just what I've spoke about. Okay, so the data that was missing from this presentation <laughs> is that of the young people who told us that all of their schools were mostly, um, had mostly inappropriate, all of their school provisions <coughs> were mostly inappropriate at their school or most current school. Um, the reason why that's missing is because of my lack of statistical analysis um, expertise and I'm yet to quite work out how to add that in. I am looking at it, um, but I think that's probably a couple of days of work that I'll have to do outside of my normal job to get that done. But that's, yeah, that's definitely a big uh, limitation of, of this presentation. I think there needs to be further exploration of the 14 school provisions, and like I was saying before, I weighted them all equally. Um, so the young people who only had four, there's no indication of which four. <laughs> Um, qualitative data with school students directly responding to these four school provisions might give us more of an indication about their relationship with those different things and, and, and what is they deem as most important uh, for them. And then further exploration is the pro protective factors of parents and carers, particularly in that relationship between school and home. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to move into some questions and answers. So we are going to stop the live stream. Okay. <laughs> that way you can feel free to ask questions and make comments without feeling a bit hindered by the general public.